Good morning. The Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation will come to order. I want to thank our witnesses who are here today on the FAA uh, uh, ODA organization expert panel report. I also want to recognize our former colleague, uh, Peter DeFazio, is in the audience, and thank him for his work on the ANCSA legislation uh, with this committee. Today, we will hear from three experts on the organization design authorization, the expert panel's final report. I want to mention, I appreciate the witnesses being here today, but I want to acknowledge this is directly from the uh, report uh, that, quote, the successful completion of this report was made possible with the cooperation and assistance of the following organizations, the Federal Aviation Administration, the Boeing Company, American Airlines, Bell, Textron, Inc., University of Southern California, Viterbi School of Engineering, and special thanks to Brittany Goodwin, Mina Mitchell, and Heather Thorson analysis supported by data and assessment teams within the office of FAA, uh, FAA's ODA. I want to mention that because you're the representatives of all of those people today, and we could have had uh, many people here, but wanted to appreciate the work of the two chairs of the committee and for you being here as representatives of these individuals today. We are joined by Dr. Javier De Luis, uh, lecturer of MIT's School of Technology, Department of Aeronautics, and astronautics, uh, thank you so much for being here. Dr. Tracy Dillinger, Manager for Safety Culture of Human Factors at NASA, and Dr. Namadine uh, Mishkati, Professor of University of Southern California School of Engineering and Aviation Safety Programs. The expert panel's 53 recommendations regarding Boeing's ODA safety management system, safety culture, serves as an important catalyst for us in future aviation legislation. While we've made some safety improvements through the air certification reform law, and some of that is still playing out with a new administrator who I think is more aggressively taking the responsibilities of the act seriously, we look to build on those advancements with a five-year authorization bill and some enhanced safety features, but we're not going to stop there. There's more to be done to implement the recommendations from your report. We owe uh, a debt of gratitude to those who are here today. I want to uh, especially thank you, uh, Dr. DeLuise, thank you so much for being here. I can't imagine uh, the tragedy of losing your sister in one of the MAX crashes and then continuing to be involved in trying to correct and improve our safety culture. But I can just say uh, I so appreciate you being here and the active role that you have played in all of these discussions. The expert panel's final report focused on the importance of safety management systems. And while Boeing was required to adopt an SMS in 2015 as part of an FAA settlement agreement, and while the FAA later adopted voluntary SMS programs, the expert panel's report make it clear now that we need a real SMS with teeth. Both Boeing and the FAA need strong and effective safety management systems, not in name, but in reality. Safety management system might, for the public, sound like um, hmm, uh, management strategies that maybe they shouldn't pay attention to, but when it comes to this management strategy and it revolves around aviation, it is about saving lives. That is why Section 102 of ANCSA required that the FAA develop a real SMS standard for aviation manufacturers, and the, AV and the agency expects, the FAA expects to finalize that SMS rule this June. This expert panel made several recommendations, findings about the safety culture and about ODA, and I wanna highlight some, that Boeing safety management procedures are not thoroughly understood throughout the company. I'm sure you'll expand on this, that it is focused um, on only one of the four pillars of what ICAO, the international standard, has said that you have to meet if you're going to have an SMS program understood by the workforce writ large. I'm sure you'll expound on this. The expert panel raised concerns about the FAA's ability to effectively oversee Boeing's SMS and I believe the FAA needs not only a strong workforce strategy to exercise the oversight of the manufacturers to ensure proper implementation of SMS, I'd like to query the panel today on exactly what SMS the 
FAA should implement in their own house to make sure that they are improving the safety culture and standing up on these important safety measures. Right now, um, we are relying on employee safety reporting system speak up, which you talked about. And I think the co a comprehensive system that the employees know and understand has to be a key component of SMS. And documentation provided by the interviews of Boeing employees show that they uh, may not have understood how safety fit into the culture of the overall obligations of the company. Human factors have not been prioritized as a technical discipline, and human factors are at the core of focus of what we need to do both at the FAA and at Boeing. Uh, while I think you did talk about the loss of experience and capability of a workforce, we definitely want to build that expertise uh, throughout uh, government, clearly at the FAA, so that they can keep pace with technological change. And while the restructuring of Boeing's ODA unit uh, uh, did decrease the opportunity, as your report is saying, for retaliation, uh, we still are seeing that interference is occurring. This is unacceptable. ANCSA strengthened uh, the FAA's oversight and put them in charge of these employees, and we certainly expect the FAA to back up those individual engineers and machinists who are calling out safety and making sure that they address those. Although the final report gave Boeing six months to make this action plan a reality, the expert panel's recommendations, the FAA administrator has cut this time to 90 days and I expect the company to comply with this deadline and submit a serious plan that demonstrates this commitment to these kind of safety measures. The FSA must also demonstrate that it is going to be a strong regulator on these issues. I hope to query the panel about how to ensure that, how we, as the oversight committee of the FAA, in strength, basically strengthen this oversight by the FAA. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. Again, thank you so much for being here. And now I turn to Senator Cruz for his opening remark, and then we'll hear from our two uh, subcommittee colleagues on their statement as well. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Madam Chair. The United States sets the be benchmark for flight safety, and by arguably the most important measure, 2023 was a remarkably safe year for aviation, with no fatal accidents or hull losses for commercial jet aircraft. Flying commercial remains the safest way to travel, but understandably, recent incidents have left the flying public worried. The perception is things are getting worse. The public wants the Federal Aviation Administration and Congress to confront perceived risks in order to restore confidence for flyers. That brings me to the topic of today's hearings, the FAA's Organization Designation Authorization Program. ODA is important to the future of aviation safety, as well as to American competitiveness. I appreciate the work of our congressionally appointed expert panel, which reviewed Boeing's ODA for transport airplanes. Congress established this panel in the aftermath of the tragic crashes of Lion Air Flight 610 in 2018 and Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 in 2019, in which 346 people tragically lost their lives. The panel's final report was released in February and three of its members are here with us today. Welcome. As a brief aside, I want to in particular acknowledge that one of our witnesses, Dr. Javier de Luis, lost his sister on Flight 302. Dr. de Luis, please accept my sincere condolences and thank you for continuing to speak out on an issue that I know has grieved you and your family personally. I also want to recognize the other families that are here today, remembering their loved ones whose lives were lost on those two tragic accidents. Discussing ODA and what changes may be needed is critical, and I welcome this conversation. It is worth noting, however, that the FAA is still implementing the Aircraft Certification Safety and Accountability Act, this committee's response to the MAX 8 crashes. crashes. It has not even been fully, it is not even fully implemented the 2018 FAA Authorization Act, even as we are currently negotiating the current reauthorization. 
While it is clear that Boeing's culture and safety management needs drastic improvement, we should not rush to legislate just for the sake of legislating. To that point, I look forward to engaging with today's witnesses, all of whom deserve our appreciation and thanks for their hard work on this effort. Their report was a consensus product issued without any dissenting views, which all of us in Congress can appreciate is no small accomplishment. And I hope to better understand their recommendations and how Congress can work to improve aviation safety in a targeted and effective manner. While discussing ODA and Boeing's safety culture is important, the flying public is also acutely worried about why pieces of Boeing airplanes are falling from the sky. The experts panel report specifically noted that the panel was not directed to investigate or provide recommendations towards specific airplane incidents or accidents, which occurred prior to or during the expert panel's work. In addition to today's hearing, I believe we also need to hear from the FAA and from Boeing itself about episodes like Alaska Airlines Flight 1282. Our committee needs to understand not only Boeing's ODAs, but the specific production missteps that caused the January incident. And we need to hear from Boeing directly about the company's safety culture and safety management writ large. The public will want to know what changes Boeing is making to restore confidence in its brand. Boeing is a great American company with a great history and great legacy, and we all want Boeing to be successful. But when accountability is needed, and it clearly is here, we should not hesitate to demand answers. And for Boeing to succeed going forward, those answers need to be given and changes need to be made to ensure that safety is central. When each of us, when our families, when our children get on an airplane, we want to trust that we're going to land safely. That's the topic of this hearing, and I hope subsequent hearings as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cruz. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Cantwell, for holding this hearing and for your commitment to continued oversight. I also want to thank our witnesses uh, and all those who worked on the expert panel review. This review confirms my view that we need to judge Boeing not by what it, that we need to judge Boeing by what it does, not by what it says it's doing. Boeing says it prioritizes safety above all else, but when the expert panel asked Boeing to produce evidence of this commitment, the evidence that Boeing provided, and I quote, did not provide objective evidence of a foundational commitment to safety that matched Boeing's descriptions of that objective, end quote. That should be shocking. But based on some of Boeing's recent actions, frankly, it's not. Weeks after a door plug blew out of a 737 MAX 9, Boeing was still petitioning the FAA for a safety exemption to rush its next 737 MAX variant into service, despite the fact that it had, no, it had a known potentially catastrophic safety okay. defect. To its credit, under pressure, Boeing eventually withdrew okay. that petition. But the fact that Boeing filed it in the first place speaks volumes about the lack of a proper safety culture at Boeing, and until recently, the lack of a proper regulatory culture at the FAA. Boeing filed this petition because they thought FAA would grant it. Boeing thought they could minimize the significance of this safety defect and that the FAA would just let it slide. Boeing had a good reason to think this. FAA let Boeing's bad actions on the 737 MAX slide for years, and go figure, we're seeing more bad results. I'll give two examples which I think are particularly relevant to our discussion today about Boeing's Organization Designation Author- Authorization, or the ODA. The first example involves MCAS. Boeing downplayed MCAS so successfully, it actually persuaded the FAA to let Boeing remove it from the flight manual. And after MCAS crashed two 737 MAX planes, killing 346 people, Investigators uncovered an internal Boeing memo showing that Boeing had been explicitly planning to downplay MCAS in order to avoid regulatory scrutiny. The plan called for Boeing to not even use the term MCAS when describing the plane to a regulator. Even worse, the memo showed an ODA unit member approved this plan to deceive a regulator. 
And yet when this memo surfaced, the FAA did nothing. It did not even investigate. By sitting on its hands, FAA effectively told Boeing that this type of conduct was perfectly fine. The second example concerns the angle of attack disagree alert, the AOA disagree alert. Shortly after the 737 MAX 8 went into service, Boeing discovered that the AOA disagree alert was not functioning on most of the 737 MAX jets, which was a violation of the plane's approved type design. Instead of reporting this to the FAA and to 737 MAX pilots, Boeing intentionally concealed this and continued to manufacture more than more 737 MAX jets with the same defects. In other words, Boeing made a decision to knowingly and repeatedly violate its approved type design for years. Boeing's ODA knew about this, but did not alert the FAA. And when FAA finally found out that Boeing had been knowingly and repeatedly violating its approved type design, the FAA did nothing. This effectively told Boeing that type design doesn't matter because the FAA isn't going to always enforce it. When the FAA fails to take action in response to bad behavior, it sends an unmistakable message to both Boeing and its employees that bad behavior is acceptable. No wonder the expert panel found that Boeing employees are so confused. FAA needs to more closely scrutinize Boeing's behavior and make use of its civil enforcement authority when appropriate. And I am pleased by the more aggressive regulatory tone Administrator Whitaker has brought to the agency. But as this expert panel review makes clear, there is still a long way to go to bring an effective safety culture back to Boeing. We have our work cut out for us on this committee as we continue our oversight and consider whether additional legislation may be needed. And I thank the panelists for being here. I really appreciate your hard work on this to make flying safer for the American people. Thank you, and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Senator Duckworth, and for your leadership and your help on the um, FAA reauthorization and safety improvements in that bill. Um, I guess Senator Moran will not be here for an opening statement. I'm sure he will be attending, um, but we'll now just go to the witnesses. So Dr. DeLuise, again, thank you so much for being here. You're uh, free to make an opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator. Um, Chair Cantwell, uh, Ranking Member Cruz, and members of the committee, on behalf of myself and my fellow panelists, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come here and talk about our findings and recommendations from the final report. My name, as you know, is Javier de Luis. I'm an aerospace engineer, that's how I would describe myself. I earned a doctorate from, uh, in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT. I spent my 40-year career in private industry, mostly running small businesses that I helped start. Uh, then we built hardware for NASA, DOD, and other agencies. I'm currently a lecturer at MIT, but I'm also the brother of Graciela de Luis, as you have noted. And um, my sister was killed when the airplane she was on, the 737 MAX, crashed a few minutes after takeoff, uh, killing all 157 people on board. So for me, serving on this panel has been an opportunity to help prevent anyone else from going through what I and my family have sadly experienced these past five years. Our panel met for almost a year, reviewed over 4,000 pages of documents provided to us by Boeing, interviewed 250 Boeing employees at all levels of the organization, from the executive suite down to the uh, people that uh, tightened the bolts, across six different geographic plants uh, across the country, and we reviewed thousands of survey responses uh, that came to us through uh, several surveys that, we, that were conducted. As has been noticed, this is a consensus report and I'd be, I'd be remiss if I did not give full credit to this to our co-chairs, co Michael Bartron and Keith Morgan, for hurting what was at time this diverse and rather unruly group to hopefully a productive end. Our, channel was, our panel was charged by AXA uh, <coughs> to focus its review on three specific topics, the safety culture, the safety management systems, and the ODA program at Boeing. We were, however, also allowed to evaluate other topics of concern that we might identify that would impact the safety of the flying public. As Senator Cruz noted, we were not charged, or I'm sorry, it's one of, it was noticed previously, we were not charged with investigating specific uh, airplane incidents uh, that occurred prior to our panels, but it was, as you, it's understandable, on several occasions during our activities when safety issues arose with Boeing products, we of course considered them. My fellow witnesses and I felt that it would be useful to expand on several of the key recommendations in our report, as this may help the stage for today's, set the stage for today's hearing. 
First and foremost is one that uh, has been talked about re since the report came out, is our finding that there exists a disconnect, for lack of a better word, between the words that are being said by Boeing management and what is being seen and experienced by employees across the company. They hear, safety is our number one priority. But what they see is that that's only true as long as your production milestones are met. And at that point, it's push it out the door as fast as you can. They hear, speak up if you see anything that's unsafe. But what they see is that if they do speak up, they get very little feedback. And if they insist, they may find themselves on the short end of the stick next time raises or bonuses or, or, or job transfers come up or even worse. We found this disconnect to be present at almost all levels and at all work sites that we visited. We heard it from technicians, we heard it from engineers, and we heard it, more concerning, from members of the ODA uh, that are delegated by the FAA to conduct inspections and tests on behalf of the government. To me, it is clear that the commitment to change, the level of change, and the pace of change at Boeing is not commensurate with the events that created the need for all this change in the first place, namely the two fatal crashes of two brand new airplanes five years ago. It, it was distressing to read a recent statement by um, Brian West, the CFO of Boeing, speaking about the Alaska Air incidents from this past January where he said, for years, and this is a quote, for years we prioritized the movement of the airplane through the factory over getting it done right. That's got to change. The leadership team got it in the immediate aftermath of January 5th. Now, I would have thought that they would have gotten it five years ago. In closing, I'll note that for the last 20 years, every FAA Reauthorization Act pushed more and more responsibility over the fence to the manufacturer's side. At the time, this was done with the understandable objective of increasing efficiency and productivity. The two MAX crashes showed that the pendulum had swung too far, and AXA was the response to try to correct this. But AXA cannot be the high watermark in your efforts. I urge you as you debate additional steps that can be taken to ensure that you increase the FAA oversight of Boeing and that you keep pushing for structural change at the company, and as well as ensuring that all of our panel's 53 recommendations are fully implemented believe that this is the only way that we can return this company to what we all remember it once being, a company known for engineering excellence, and a company where the headlines were written about it because of its accomplishments and not because of its failures. I believe the flying public deserves no less. I will now turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Dillinger. Dr. Dillinger, welcome. Um, whatever opening statement you can make, that would be great. Thank you. Chair Cantwell and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss the report of the ODA for transport airplanes from the expert panel review. I'm Dr. Tracy Dillinger, and I'm currently the senior executive psychologist for safety culture and human factors programs within the NASA Office of Safety and Mission Assurance. In this position, I have created and chaired the agency's safety culture working group and the human factors task force and I'm responsible for NASA's safety culture survey, safety culture courses, safety culture audits and assessments, human factors mishap investigation support, human factors training, and our annual human factors report. I'm also a proud veteran of the United States Air Force, where for over 20 years, I served as a human factors investigator, human factors instructor, 10 years as the chief aviation psychologist, and in numerous roles, including the Chief of Safety Assessments for the Air Force Safety Center and served on the Columbia Accident Investigation Board. I've spent the majority of my career working in the field of aerospace and aviation safety. I'm truly passionate about safety culture, human factors, and their combined effect on organizational performance. Clearly, a robust safety culture is essential to preventing mishaps. Safety is a NASA core value, along with excellence, teamwork, integrity, and diversity, and it's integral to everything we do. We strive to create an environment where everyone works safely, feels comfortable communicating safety issues, learns from both mistakes and 
successes, and feels confident balancing challenges and risks. The International Civil Aviation Organization describes safety culture as arguably the single most important influence on the management of safety and recognizes the interdependence of safety culture and safety management, noting that effective safety management empowers a positive safety culture, and a positive safety culture empowers effective safety management. I was privileged to participate in the ODA panel where I was able to lend my knowledge and passion for safety culture to the work of my fellow panelists with whom I had the privilege to serve. Boeing, like NASA, uses Jim Reason's five-factor model of safety culture, comprised of reporting, just, flexible, learning, and informed elements. While the company has begun addressing reporting and just culture training, it needs to enlarge its safety culture program to include all areas, all five factors, using multiple means, and the program should be endorsed, promoted, and modeled by its leaders. Employees, including team leads, managers, and senior leaders, need to know what to do when a deficit has been reported. That includes ensuring that tools and processes are available so, so employees can report without fear of reprisal, managers can listen, reported issues are fixed and then communicated with recognition given to those who come forward with concerns. It's equally important that senior leaders continually message and demonstrate to their workforce that safety is a critical, fundamental aspect of doing business, even over profit. Aviation safety isn't just good for the flying public. Ultimately, it's good for successful operations and mission accomplishment, and that's good for business. I believe that successful adoption of the report's recommendations will improve the level of safety provided by Boeing to its workforce, operators, and the public. I would note that while the panel focused on Boeing as an ODA holder, the panel's findings and recommendations contain numerous best practices that could assist other companies with similar authorizations to implement successful safety culture, safety management systems, or ODA programs. Thank you once again for inviting me to appear before you today, and I look forward to discussing these important issues with members of the committee. I yield to Dr. Mishkati. Thank you again so much for being here, and thank you for your uh, uh, management strategy books, uh, Managing the Risk of Organizational Accidents from James Reason. Thank you so much uh, for the leadership at the university on these issues. Good morning, Chairman Canfield and uh, distinguished senators uh, uh, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for inviting us, the FAA expert panel members, to testify before you today. I am Naj Meshkati. I'm a professor of engineering at the University of Southern California. I'm also a senior faculty member with the 20, 72 years old USC Aviation Safety and Security Program. And I have an affiliation with Harvard Kennedy School Project on Managing the Atom. For the past four decades, I have been conducting interdisciplinary research on system safety, human factors, safety culture, and risk reduction of complex technological systems. These systems include aviation, oil and gas drilling, pipeline and refining, nuclear power, and healthcare. System failures in these industries, these safety critical systems, have a deadly impact on humans and the environment. I have developed many courses at USC around this area. I've been involved in several accident investigations like BP Deepwater Horizon. I've visited several nuclear plants like Chernobyl, Fukushima, and Trimal Island. But my participation in this distinguished expert panel 
and working with my great colleagues on this panel, further corroborated what my research experience has taught me in the last 40 years. And this is it. The safety culture is the foundation, as Dr. Dillinger mentioned. Safety culture is the foundation of any processes and operation in organization. It could make or break the system. As my mentor, Professor James Reason said, quote, safety culture can affect all elements in the system for good or ill, end of quote. I believe safety culture is analogous to human body's immune system, which protects it against pathogens and fend off diseases. And it is incumbent upon the leadership of any organization to strive for immunizing and constantly boosting the healthy safety culture of the company. A healthy safety culture is based on competence, trust, transparency, and accountability. Another equally important lesson that I've learned by my participation in this panel, which also corroborated what I have learned in my career, is that human operators in this safety critical system such as pilots in the airplanes or human operators in a control room of a nuclear plant, always constitutes the system's both first and last layer of defense. First and last layer of defense, human operators. As we saw it in the case of the miracle on the Hudson and also at Fukushima Daini nuclear plant. As such, our panel found that recommended human factors and human systems integration consideration should receive attention commensurate to their importance in aviation safety and aircraft design and operation. Human factors as a cross-cutting science should become a formal, standalone, and highly prioritized discipline and a design practice at Boeing and within any company that they deal with safety critical system. And finally, my research experience has taught me that a world-class engineering company that makes or operates a safety critical system such as an aircraft must be run by world-class engineers who are thoroughly trained to understand, respect, and impact human factors and safety culture. Thank you once again for your attention to our panel support and appearing before you. Thank you. Well, thank you to all the witnesses. Uh, appreciate you being here. I, I think I have a question just generally. I want to draw this out a little bit from your report because you've, again, emphasized it, but some of these terms may just be um, in, lost on people in their significance. And so I'm just trying to understand. You're saying there isn't a singular culture uh, program on safety that is understood by the employees or that is implemented or responded to by the employees. And, and again, I want to make sure, because I'm going to get to a question about SPIA and machinists, because the frontline people are saying these are the safety problems. They're just not being backed up. And so, but I want to understand why the phenomenon exists. And I think your report says because there's three different programs and people don't know which one to pay attention to at any given time. Is that is that well, a correct understanding? If, if, I, if, I, if I may, I, I think that there, there, there are a couple of things there. I'll, I'll just try to tease them out. Uh, it is true that there is an overwhelming amount of documentation on, on SMS and safety culture at Boeing. But as has been described to me by someone recently, it's, it's sort of like if you're trying to teach your kid to drive and you give them the, the statute book on all the road rules, you know, but what they really want is the driver's manual. And what, what you're referring to is one observation that we made is that while all the documentation that exists right now on SMS and safety culture checks all the boxes that IKO says you're supposed to, for the person on the ground turning the bolts and hammering the nails, it's, they, they don't know 
we asked at all of our interviews, we said, how, what's the safety metric are you working towards? How do you, how do you know that you're doing a safe thing? And we got like, you know, you're in the headlight stairs. What are you talking about? Oh, safety, met oh, we're, you know, we got production metrics, we got this metric, but there wasn't anything about that. So, so that, that was one thing. I think the, the thing you're referring to about it being multiple, uh, multiple ways, it's there are multiple reporting ways right now at Boeing, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, having multiple ways of reporting is, is good and is encouraged. The problem we found was that, um, uh, you know, they, the, the, they just didn't seem to, there was lack of confidence in, say, for example, if you were tried to report it anonymously, there was lack of confidence that there would be an anonymous that we'd maintain. There was very lack of confidence that things would actually get done about what you were doing. And there was a very real fear of retribution and, and, and payback if, if you held your ground. And obviously, those are things that are just not compatible with any sort of safety culture or, 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 or SMS system. Any of the other witnesses want to add to that? Boeing has been working to develop and field a safety culture model throughout the organization. They've been uh, successful in providing training on some of the elements of it. They have not yet put it all together so that it, it, it works together as a system. At NASA, we use the DNA logo for it. You know, it, all of those parts work together. When someone reports something, somebody has to listen to it. The way they treat them has to be fair. There needs to be an environment of psychological safety. They need to learn from that and communicate it and pass it on. And to create that, everybody in the system needs to know what they're supposed to do and how to do it and what's expected of them. And if that doesn't work, they need to know the the next option, and if that doesn't work, they need to know the next option. That's why having multiple reporting systems can be a good thing, because if one doesn't work, the employee needs to know what else they can go to. One of the things, for example, would be to know who is the chief of safety. That would be where the buck stops. And in one of the surveys that we saw, 95% of the people who responded to the survey did not know who the chief of safety was. That, that's a deficit that could be create, corrected, but people need to learn who the key people are in that system so they know who they can go to when the processes don't work. Well, I wondered to what degree uh, this committee or uh, I did as ranking member of the committee then a whistleblower report that detailed in 2021 an FAA engineer, Michael Collins, describes an instance where the FAA manage, management overruled an engineer regarding a lithium ion battery in the 787. And notably later, the FAA had to ground the 787 in response to fires caused by the very lithium ion battery. So there was an instance where people were not listening to what people were saying on the line what needed to be done. Um, uh, there's another um, incidence where uh, Dr. Martin Bickbowler uh, stated that a more secure safety reporting system may have prevented him from facing retaliation for filing complaints about different components not meeting FAA standards. So how do we, how do we ensure that those who are speaking up about safety measures get listened to? I'm, I'm sure in this case, these two knew who to go to, but uh, just because they've been very experienced people, but this, that they weren't listened to. So what do we need? What do we do with this part of the problem? What do we need to do with the FAA? Uh, well, um, you know, in a properly functioning SMS and a properly functioning safety culture, those questions wouldn't be asked, right? Because they, they people would be empowered. People would have confidence that they wouldn't be um, that they wouldn't be smacked down if they spoke up. I don't think that's what we're dealing with here. And which is one of the reasons that, by the way, that we, in one of our recommendations, we, we encouraged, we recommended that Boeing establish what are called ASAP uh, programs, um, aviation safety action programs. They're very common in airlines. And an ASAP program ha has, is a tripartite program. It has the FAA, 
the labor and management, and if you initiate an ASAP event, you're protected. But more importantly than being protected, you, the event gets visibility at the FAA level and at and at and at, as well as the management level. And for me, I've I've been in, and when I as the, when I started on this committee, I I I quickly became became a big convert to visibility because I'm convinced that if enough eyes had seen the MCAS design 10 years ago, somebody would have raised their hand and said, hey, wait a second, maybe having a, a system that if one sensor fails, it crashes the airplane to the ground is not the best idea. But they didn't because, as was noted, it was purposely hidden, right? So I'm well, all about... Well, just to be clear, there were whistleblowers who did bring this up and said that it was um, unsafe, but they weren't listened to. They weren't so listened hard, to. They weren't listened to. Okay. And so we're, this is why we're saying good engineering, as I think you agree, wins the day, but people have to listen to the you engineers. And so... We're so, trying to dis discover here what kind of, look, our committee can only do the oversight of the FAA that enforces the FAA to do its oversight job correctly. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to know what we need to do to strengthen this. But my time has expired. I, I, I have a suspicion I'll be able to come back to this and we'll yeah, go back to it. But I'll sort of turn to Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Um, again, you know, I, I want to take... Uh, uh, deeper into this conversation. I mean, since the door plug fell out of the of the 737 uh, Max 9 for Alaska Airlines, there's been a lot of attention on Boeing's stunning lack of quality control throughout its supply chain, um, and this is understandable. And yet, uh, as we've already heard, the expert panel appears to have identified a much broader problem at Boeing: the utter absence of an effective safety culture. And I fear that merely increasing scrutiny on how a door plug is removed and replaced will fail to solve the more fundamental cultural failures that are at the root of the Boeing's flawed development and production of the 737 MAX. Um, and Dr. DeLuise, I, I would love for you to sort of go deeper in you know, the conversation we're already having, because I think you would agree with me, would you not, that fixing a specific assembly line problem would not be sufficient to get Boeing back on track and frankly, I personally think that Boeing's recent manufacturing problems are merely a symptom of a much deeper problem, uh, the destruction of a proper safety culture by you know, share price executives who time after time prioritize Wall Street profits over long-term production excellence. It's, it's sort of the replacement, the driving out of the engineers that were uh, the heart of what Boeing was. Um, so can you talk a little bit about manufacturing problems are sure. more of a symptom, but would you agree they're more of a symptom of the, of, of the bigger problem than, than you can't just fix a quality control issue and think that that's gonna solve it. Right, I completely agree. And let's talk about the door plug, just using an mm -hmm. example. Everyone's seen the picture, right, mm -hmm. of the door plug sitting there without three of the bolts. You can't see the fourth one, right? But everyone's seen that picture and they go, oh my goodness, the bolts are missing. Where was the inspector? Oh, okay, should have been inspected. But more importantly, I think, why did a, a, a mechanic install the door and walk away, leaving it in that condition. Why wasn't he or she trained to know that you just can't do that, right? And that's where you go to, you know, yes, more inspection is good. I firmly believe you can't inspect your way to quality and you can't inspect your way to safety because all it's gonna take is one slip and, you know, we're back here again. It's gotta be in the, in the DNA of the people that understand that you don't walk away from a door leaving it in an unsafe condition. Now you can even take that a little further and say you shouldn't design a door which allows the bolts to be separated from the door so that, you know, so I mean it should be captured or something. I mean you can take it all the way back up to the design level. But I completely agree that just putting out, you know, whack-a-mole, trying to, uh, playing whack-a-mole with, with QA is, uh, problems is not the way that you're gonna get there because it, that's impossible. They, you know, they, the car industry learned this a long time ago, right? You, you, don't let, you don't let cars move forward when they have defects. You fix the defect and you figure out why the defect's there and then it doesn't show up again. That's not happening here. Uh, when problems arise on the line, they, uh, the line keeps moving forward. And I think that until they take a page from, from what the, the, the US auto industry learned 30 or 40 years ago, we're not going to we're not going to be able to get to where, where we need to be for, for 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 Boeing. I would agree with you. And by the way, that picture was from a cell phone text message because when the NTSB went and asked Boeing to provide all the logs and you know 
uh, uh, back in my, in the, you know, when I flew for the Army, it was all paper logs and we switched to computerized. They can't find any logs for anybody who inspected it, who took it off, who put it back on. They still haven't been able to identify who did the work, but that picture wasn't even official. That was just a text mm -hmm. message between workers. Um, I want to get into the ODA uh, uh, reforms. After all the ODA reforms, I, I am frustrated that Boeing's ODA still allows opportunities for retaliation against those who raise safety concerns. And the expert panel found continuing problems tracking safety concerns once they're made. This sounds eerily like how ODA operated before Congress passed the uh, ACSAA Act. And in 2016, an internal Boeing survey found that 39% of Boeing authorized representatives had experienced undue pressure from Boeing. We've already talked about this a little bit. A 2020 FAA survey found that 56% of respondents from its aircraft certification service believe external pressure from industry is perceived to get in the way of safety decisions. And 49% of respondents from FAA's aviation safety office believe that safety concerns will not be addressed so they don't bother to report them. Uh, I would love for uh, uh, both uh, uh, Dr. DeLuise and um, uh, Dr. Mishkati to address this issue. Congress tried to fix this in the Aircraft Certification Reform Accountability Act, but clearly a problem remains. Does Congress have more legislative work to do, and what do you, would you recommend we do? I, I know that the panel found, made 54 suggestions, but I would love to hear. Um, Dr. Mishkati, would you like to start, kick us off? Thank you, Senator. That has been a major issue about the uh, fear for retaliation and the independence of ODA. And uh, we talk about that and we heard about that during our interviews and surveys and the documents that we reviewed. One important conclusion that we came up with, this reorganization of ODA within Boeing, that the, because Boeing, as you know better than I do, is a matrix organization. You have the functional group and you have the program group. ODA in the past was in the basically program group. Now they are reporting to the functional group. And there have been some, something which was a little bit uh, a surprise to me, that there were some non-Boeing ODA members also, which were contractors, which their, their security could be subject uh, to job stability and security could be subject to the review that they get. But with this reorganization that they have done, that the ODA unit members, they report to the functional group, they, it, it could fix that. And I want to open a parenthesis here, Senator, that in our panel, we have had manufacturers representative the, that they have ODA. We had person from uh, Golf Stream, we have person from uh, Bell Textron and uh, GE and Pratt and Whitney. They do ODA correctly. It's not that there is something fundamentally wrong or inherently wrong with ODA. ODA can be managed correctly, and these issues would not appear as much as we saw here. The, uh, the, if, if I may, uh, the, the, you asked what, what could the FAA do, whatever. My, I think that the FAA needs to take a very close look. The FAA right now approves ODA members, right? I think it needs to take a very close look as to what the organizational structure of the ODA within the company is and require it to be, you know, to, to be independent when it comes to decisions that affect the person's livelihood. It's a very hard ask for someone, you know? I mean, you're putting your livelihood at stake in order to stand your ground. Most engineers are ethical and are going to do it, but we shouldn't have to ask them, you know, to, 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 to risk their, their family livelihood. And uh, Naj, uh, Professor Mishai, brought up the issue of the contractors as ODA members. That's, to me, I'm, I'm, I was very troubled by that because, you know, a contractor's relationship with a company is very tenuous financially, right? I mean, you're basically there at, at, at will, completely at whim. Um, it, it's a big ask to, to have a contractor and that's going to stand their ground knowing that they could be, you know, shown the door the next day. I, there, are op, there are times where they're needed, you know, recently retired people that you want to bring back because of their expertise. I completely get that. But that should be the exception, I believe, and not the rule. I mean, I think you, you really want these to be full-time employees that have a little bit more security, whether they're SPIA members or not or, or whatever. You've been very indulgent, Matt. I'm sure. Thank you. 
Senator Vance and then Senator Rosen. Great. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to you and the ranking member for uh, hosting, and, and thanks to all of you for being here. Um, so first of all, I want to thank each of the witnesses for the important work you put uh, in, into this report. And I'd like to focus my questions on the uh, ODA, the Organization Des Designation Authority culture at Boeing, and more broadly, some of the concerns that have been raised about retaliation against employees uh, for identifying defects and other problems in the course of Boeing's operations. So, so in the report's executive summary, um, the expert panel found that even though Boeing's restructuring of the management of the ODA unit decreased opportunities for interference and retaliation against ODA unit managers and provided better organizational messaging regarding the independence of unit managers, something was missing. Um, now, doc, Dr. DeLuise, and I hope I'm, I'm getting that, that pronunciation right, in your executive summary, you say, and this is quoting from the report, uh, the ODA restructuring, while better, still allows opportunities for retaliation to occur, particularly with regards to salary and furlough ranking. This influences the ability of unit managers to execute their delegated functions effectively, end quote. So, Dr. DeLuise, um, I want to understand this: how this fear of retaliation manifests itself on the assembly line. So, in your investigation, did you find Boeing employees on the factory floor were empowered and encouraged by management to stop the processes if an employee detected a nonconformity or a possible defect? Uh, no, Senator. As I understand it, um, the only thing that stops the line on the factory floor is an OSHA violation. If an employee thinks that his or her life or, 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 or health can, can be threatened, they can stop the line. Everything else basically gets written up and gets put into a pro one of various processes, depending on how, on how where, it, where it sits. It gets written up and then supposedly gets addressed down the line. And this leads to the traveled work problem that we've heard about before, where you know you you have a problem, you'll fix it later. But in order to fix it later, you have to take apart something that you know wasn't there before, and that's in part what caused the the door problem. By the way, right? They had to replace some rivets. They had to remove the door. They put the door back. They forgot the bolts, etc. Um, but no, to answer your question directly, we did not find any. Uh, any encouragement or any any empowering to stop the line, they they're focused at uh, they they're focused on reporting it, and supposedly that loop should be closed and those problems fixed. But it's very difficult to say that that's actually happening. I can give you an example. Uh, in one of our interviews that I believe you and I did, Tracy, they, we were at the receiving area, the receiving room. Uh, receiving uh, sex, uh, section where they, they check out the airplanes before the FAA inspects them. And I asked them, what is the major thing that you find? They say, oh, it's FOD, foreign object uh, dam debris. And I'm like, so what happens? Well, you know, we report it, we clean it up, and we move on. I said, well, don't you track back where the FOD came from so you can be sure it doesn't happen again? And they're like, well, we put the report in and somebody's supposed to do it, but it keeps on showing up. Yeah. And that's not how you're supposed to do things if you want to fix the problem once and for all. Got it. So, so it sounds it's it it, it sounds like there was not exactly a promotion of uh, of people sort of stopping the line or, or raising these issues. I mean, is there any evidence that there was actually the opposite that there was retribution or that people were actually penalized for raising some safety concerns? Uh, th yes, that's correct. We heard reports. We we heard several reports of people uh, that uh, that felt that they were transferred or didn't get the raise that they were expecting. Now, you, please understand, we were not empowered to conduct a statistically significant, all-encompassing review. And I am very well aware that you know data is not the plural of anecdote, right? I mean, we sure we, we're, I'm, repla I'm I'm re recounting anecdotes, but. That's what we heard, and that's I think that that's that's our impression from okay. from a year of sending this. So, so being mindful of time, um, I, I appreciate your I appreciate your testimony. I mean, one quick question, I guess, is to follow up, and, and maybe we can sort of further follow up with my staff um, in in a detailed way. I mean, is there anything that you think Congress could do to sort of solve or at least improve? This, this, this sort of basic incentive problem, right? If you're going to be penalized for raising safety concerns, then you're going to raise safety concerns. So we want to actually promote people for, for, for raising valid safety concerns. What do you think Congress could do to meaningfully change this? 
as, as, I, as I mentioned in, in response to an earlier question, one, one thing you could do is you could, um, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm not a, in your shoes, so I don't know if it's legislation or encourage or direct, but the setting up additional channels for where people can come and report without fear of retaliation, such as the ASAP program, I think would be a very good step. Okay. Well, th th thank you, Dr. Lewis, and uh, I appreciate it. And I know you you personally have suffered some some tragedy because of some of these problems. And so, uh, I'm grateful for your work on this, but also my condolences. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just on that um, point about Dr. Lewis, you're saying that if somebody knew about either the batteries or the MCAST or whatever, that what you're talking to one line manager, you want a broader awareness and you want a broader awareness even at the FAA so that it isn't just the FAA one person overriding the line manager. Yeah, right, Senator. I mean, you know, I'm a belt and suspenders kind of guy. I, I think that you need to have you need to have more visibility in order to prevent the things that we saw uh, on MCAS in, in, uh, in Congressman DeFazio's report, you know, that where one person could basically hide the existence or, 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 or suppress the existence of, of certain systems or, or, or make sure that they don't go very far. Uh, it, it's not, it, when we were discussing this in our panel, several people brought up, you know, in a properly functioning SMS, you don't need ASAP programs. That is absolutely true. But that's not the world that we're in right now. So, and, and, and there may be other things besides ASAP. ASAP was just the one that when we were at American Airlines, they talked to us about it and they were very, very positive about the, the impact that that's had on their SMS at American. And so it really resonated with many of us on the panel and that's why it's in the report. As a... a, a a broadening of the communication. Right, uh, yeah, the key right, thing is, exactly. The key thing is to broaden, again, I would just wanna, I know you keep referring to this one instance, but I'm assuming you're re referring to some of the uh, actions by people who may have tried to hide that information from the FAA, but this committee also received whistleblower reports from people who made it very clear they had concerns. Right. It's just that you, we have to figure out this larger communication. And it shouldn't take a whistleblower report, right? I mean, a whistleblower report is a big deal for somebody to do, right? I mean, it, yes. it's often a career-ending move, whereas as the, the, as the ASAP uh, the, has been described to us, you know, a, a mechanic can say, this was actually a case that was brought up, you know, I'm not sure if I put in the locking pins on that panel. And he goes and reports it. And that immediately, he's not gonna be fired for, for making that mistake. The focus is gonna be, well, why didn't you? Is there a problem in the process? The first, the focus is first is let's get the airplane down if it's in the air and make sure it's safe. And then it's why didn't it happen? What, is there a problem with the process? Is there a problem with the training? And then make sure that that never happens again. I think that's the attitude that we need to encourage across the airplane, the aviation world, but in particular at Boeing. Thank you. Senator Rosen. It's really important, and this hearing is so important. And I really want to thank the panel for um, your hard work on this and your care. Uh, it matters, and we're, we're grateful because as Americans look to Congress to address recent Boeing incidents that have placed passenger safety at risk, we're reminded that American air travel can only remain safe and reliable as a form of transportation through vigilant oversight and accountability, just like the hearing we're having right now. I want to thank you again for taking the time to be here, answering questions about the findings and the recommendations that were provided in the expert review panel's final report. And so the report found that for aviation safety matters, input from Boeing's pilots, pilots were neither consistently nor directly, directly delivered to the highest level of decision makers in the organization. It also noted that the chief pilot position did not have the same authority as other executive positions. This is concerning, given that Boeing's pilots are uniquely qualified to identify those safety issues and hazards inherent to a company's aircraft. It's clear that the expertise our pilots provide need to be elevated within Boeing's ODA process, and your recommendations are consistent with that. So Dr. Mishkadi and then Dr. Dillinger, can you both elaborate on why the expertise that pilots provide is essential to evaluating Boeing's aircrafts and what can Congress do to ensure that pilots have a greater seat, not just in the cockpit, but at the table at moving forward so that their expertise can enhance aviation safety? 
We'll go Dr. Meshkati first, please. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Rosen. That's a very, very important and profound question. That, in fact, relates to uh, our findings, uh, number 2425, and towards several recommendations about that. Uh, it is my position, and I think our expert panel has very specifically said that, that the, the chief pilot and the pilot, and basically the way that the pilots, they could uh, bring up their voice to be heard and be paid attention to is through a very robust human factors group. If we can have that robust human factors group and make it a line function, with the authority that commensurates with its role, I think that issue that you said can be resolved. Uh, I heard that in, uh, in Boeing, they say the structures is the king because of the impact and importance that they have. And I've said that to my student, if structures is the king, human factors and voice of pilot has to be at least the queen in Boeing because this is equally important as as equally important as the structures. I think this issue that you raised is very close to my heart and very close to the heart of my colleagues on the panel, and that's what we made this recommendation. We use the term, Senator, design practice in our recommendation, uh, recommendation uh, uh, for the, uh, these findings associated with the findings about that. Design practice has a very special and important me uh, meaning in, uh, in Boeing. And if this issue that you said be raised at that level and it gets to a design practice, I think some of these issues can be resolved. Thank you. Dr. Dellinger, would you like to add um, something? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, the pilots are the customers in a great sense. And so the reason why it's important to hear from the pilots is they're critical in the design from a human factors perspective of the flight deck. The human factors inputs and the pilots inputs go together. The pilots mm -hmm. need to have a strong voice and their opinion needs to have a of strong weight. They should be the ones who are providing feedback to those designs and making adjustments in those designs. Equally so, we, we learned as the panel that when you say Boeing pilots, that has changed a little bit. <clears throat> and the pilots are no longer Boeing employees, they're contractor employees. And so again, the ability for them to have a voice at the proper level with the design modifications that take their opinions into account, the panel felt that that was important. Well, thank you very much. I see my time has expired, but I do want to say the human factor matters. There are humans on that plane. It matters to all of us. It's not just the structure. And so thank you for your hard work. I'm Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you so much, Senator Rosen. Uh, Senator Budd. Thank you, Chair. And again, thank you all for being here. You know, the expert panel report notes that Boeing human factors specialists have played a diminished role in the design and functionality of recent aircraft. Uh, but it was once considered the gold standard in this area. Dr. Dellinger, can you share any of the specific steps Boeing staff shared with the expert panel to rebuild its human factors capability or any additional recommendations you have to Boeing uh, to restore Boeing as the gold standard in human factors engineering? And Dr. Dellinger, please. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the human factors cadre has diminished uh, recently, and the company has made uh, a great effort to bring in more human factors expertise. They know that that is critical. Uh, it needs to also be a, in a standalone organization where uh, they can have a voice formally. And uh, we were introduced to the new senior uh, tech discipline lead for human factors, who is developing a new cadre, but that is a critical element to the design and, uh, and it's essential for future designs. Thank you. 
Um, Dr. DeLuise, again, thank you for being here. Uh, in 2019, Boeing launched the Speak Up portal, an internal online platform meant to provide a place where employees could, could confidentially report concerns on a number of factors, including production quality. Speak Up is one of the many channels employees have used to report concerns uh, to the company. Yet in several places, the report finds that employees, and I quote, did not understand how to utilize the different reporting systems, which, which reporting systems to use and when, end quote, and that many of the employees preferred to report issues directly to their manager. Uh, so is there any record of how many production quality concerns were reported through uh, the Speak Up program or other reporting system as opposed to reporting directly to the managers? Um, I, I know they keep track of how many Speak Up reports they have. I don't have those numbers uh, in front of me. I did, however, recently read that since the um, door incident, they've had a 500% increase. And I remember that one of the last briefings we got from Boeing, I asked, well, is that good or is that bad, right? Because there are two ways to look at this. What's a, what num how many speak ups would you expect normally, right? Never really got clear. But to go to your point, uh, to your question, excuse me, the, um, there's nothing wrong with having multiple reporting systems. What our concern was, what our concerns were, there were multiple. One is that people are, have trouble believing that anything they put in Speak Up is going to actually result in any action. That was one. The other concern was that most people prefer to deal with their problems by talking to their manager. That's not necessarily a bad thing. However, we were not convinced that there was actually a path from when that report goes up to the manager for it to be captured into the safety system. So what I mean is, if you have a problem in your particular station on the line, for example, and you report it to your manager, you may fix it right then and there, and then that's the end of it. And maybe that's appropriate for minor things, but for all you know, somebody at another production, on another line is having exactly that same problem, and there wasn't, we did not see any sort of mandatory reporting sort of requirements in order to make sure that that gets captured and subsequently learned from. I mean, that's one of the key tenets of SMS, right? You're supposed to be, you're supposed to learn from your, from, from what happens. And so that was problematic. And in addition, of course, that sometimes you want, that if you're just doing it that way, there is no assurance that it was done in the best and most proper way, as opposed to the way to just get it done and keep the line moving. So you want, you want to have those, you want to make sure that they, you have those checks and balances as well. So those were sort of our broad concerns about Speak Up. It's a good program, I think. I mean, it's not a bad, the intentions are very good. It can be a good program. People need to be trained, and people, but more importantly, people need to begin to see results when they report stuff into it, that things actually change, that nobody gets fired for reporting, that nobody gets, you know, uh, uh, anything bad happens. And that, uh, and, that, and that their reporting is making a difference. I think that there was a lot of skepticism about that, which is why people keep going to their managers or their union rep or whatever, the most local thing. Do you think the 500% increase in reporting um, in the system was due to more training or clarifying or just a new safety emphasis? Do you think it's, uh, do you think it's What's your notion? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, well, I, I, there was clearly at the, you know, they've been told uh, yet again that, uh, to, to, that if they see something, they need to speak up. So I think that there's some of that. I think that the real question is, how, is it going to be a lasting, a, a lasting blip? You know, there, there, there's probably a right number of speak up reports to have per month. I don't know what that number is. If you have zero, well, maybe you're doing a perfect job, but most likely nobody is really using the system. And if you have thousands, well, you've got deeper problems, right? I'm not sure where the, the, the balance is, unfortunately. We need to look at what the longer term data is going to tell us. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. I just wanted to note, too, that in this uh, large discussion about human factors, in ANCSA, uh, we required that the human factors assessment has to be done before um, the certification, and that no longer can the FAA delegate the human factors assessment. They have to do it themselves. So, um, Senator Klobuchar, and then Senator Schmidt, and uh, I think Senator Welch. So, uh, Senator Klobuchar. Yes, thank you, Chair, for this important hearing. 
Um, and uh, thank you. And I'm so sorry, uh, Dr. DeLuis, about your sister. We also lost a Minnesotan on that plane. And um, thank you for your advocacy. Um, I'm going to start with you, uh, Professor Mishkati. And can you talk about why it's critical we invest in a strong pipeline into the aviation field? And I'm obsessed with this just because, you know, whether it's air traffic controllers or mechanics or the like, um, what's going to happen if we don't invest? Sorry, your question, Senator Gorbachev, was uh, investing on the pipeline for training in, in yes. aviation safety. Yes. That's extremely important, particularly, and thanks for that question. Right now, one of the uh, issues that we are facing is the uh, workforce attrition. There have been a lot of uh, retirement and exodus from Boeing and other places. And the issue of training is becoming very important and workforce development. In fact, uh, uh, this thing for the safety critical system uh, in in the case of aviation being air traffic controller and pilots and engineers and machinists and also in other industries. Uh, I've been just two weeks ago at the board of uh, Gulf Offshore Energy Safety of National Academy. The workforce development for the uh, energy system in the Gulf of Mexico is also another issue, particularly with coming with the new technologies like a wind turbine. In this particular case, one solution is basically joining forces with technical colleges and universities and develop internship program and uh, for the students that they get the training and they go work and then they come back and continue their education. This is something that I know that uh, for uh, this new technology of the offshore wind, some organizations in the Gulf of Mexico and some companies and maybe BSEE uh, is getting involved in that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Dillinger, you mentioned how uh, pilots and crew need to play an important role in the design and evaluation of aircrafts. Um, can you also speak to the importance of training new pilots? It's essential that uh, we grow new pilots and that novice pilots have experienced pilots to help them learn and become superior experienced pilots. And the pipeline of pilots is a, is a constant effort. Uh, I think from a human factors perspective, again, the more experience we get from the pilot cadre and the more they learn how to speak up and make their needs known, especially from a design perspective. The panel was very concerned about the human factors element coming into design from the very beginning, and that requires experienced pilots having input into that process. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. DeLuise, um, what additional FAA oversight do you believe is necessary to ensure a stronger safety culture? Uh, I think that um, we covered a little bit before with regards to making sure that the FAA uh, is able to vet and, and approve the not just the people but also the organizations, um, as well as, uh, as higher scrutiny for non-employee ODA members. I think that um, one of the things that, uh, that has been touched on here is the need for the FAA to also establish a, an, its own SMS. Right? I mean, the FAA has an SMS on the ATC side, but not on the other side. I, I, as I understand it, and I'm by no means, even though I'm an expert panel, I'm an expert in SMS, uh, but as I understand it, SMSs work best when they sort of intermesh with each other. The, the, sure. the, the, the Boeing with its, with its suppliers and the regulators. Uh, I, you know, it's a little difficult to see how the, the FAA is gonna be able to do um, the, sort of the vetting uh -huh. of the Boeing SMS system, I'm sorry, w without it having its own SMS, sorry. Exactly. Okay, um, just one last question, um, Professor, Professor Mishkati, on the, uh, I passed a bill with Senators Moran and Capito, Senator Stauber in the House, uh, Representative Stauber in the House, um, which alerts personnel to uh, potential safety hazards, the NOTAM system, 
and how we need to upgrade it. Um, as we do the long overdue work of upgrading that technology, how can updated technology strengthen safety culture? The technology needs to be updated with equal and uh, adequate attention to organizational factors. One thing that we have said over here just by bringing the new technology or even if you have a updated technology, but if you don't do workforce training and also change the organizational mechanism that could adopt that technology, it wouldn't work. The issue of the adoption of the technology in the organization is very important. We have seen that, uh, Senator Kolbochar, in the case of positive train control, for example, for railroad system. This is very important issue that you raise and needs to be addressed in a very systematic manner. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Schmidt. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> when I first learned about this hearing, I was under the impression that we would be speaking to people on the ground whether current or previous, with current or previous experience within Boeing to examine the current safety issues the company's facing. However, I'm surprised to see that not a single Boeing employee or executive present today discussed their safety and cultural practices and ongoing efforts to right the wrongs that have unfortunately occurred. So let me reiterate, we have a hearing about Boeing safety practices without Boeing present. This is frustrating. Uh, it's even more frustrating that um, another committee just sat down the hallway here is instead having a Boeing representative appear before their members to answer their questions and concerns. The member of the Senate, as, a mem as members of the Senate Commerce Committee, we possess the authority to hear from representatives from Boeing on, or any other company that falls within our jurisdiction on short notice. Today's hearing is about examining the findings of a report about Boeing's procedures. They should at the very least be here today to respond to any recommendations or findings from the report. On a similar note, I've been on this committee now for almost a year and a half, and during that time, our transportation sector has experienced a number of challenges under this administration including a concerning trail, train derailment in East Palestine, a nationwide shutdown of our national air system, near misses along runways in our nation's airports, and most recently a devastating collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Yet, I along with my colleagues have yet to have the opportunity to question Secretary Buttigieg, the one person charged with leading our transportation system. Joining this committee, I expected us in a bipartisan way to rigorously examine and resolve critical issues facing our nation that fall within the jurisdiction of this committee. Yet today, it appears we are again missing the mark. Therefore, today's hearing is yet another chapter in an unfortunate series of events where we as a committee could be making a larger impact, finding answers to questions, and fully executing the duties as members of this great committee. To be clear, this is not an indictment of our witnesses whose knowledge and insight are invaluable. The report to which they contributed provides many recommendations to which I hope Boeing not only reads, but strongly considers in its efforts to get its house in order. Correct. However, for a comprehensive oversight, I think we should be hearing directly from Boeing and its representatives today on how they're addressing the findings and executing changes within the company. Rumored hearings in months down the line don't do anything to help Missourians flying today. As I wanna to transition to questions for our panel today, I do wanna focus on how as a committee with the chair, um, who I do enjoy working with, how we can actually uh, deliver the world's leading transportation system and keep Americans safe. So with that, I don't have a lot of time, but uh, Dr. Dr. Dillinger, um, based on the report and based on the findings, um, again, this would be something I would be asking somebody from Boeing, but to your knowledge, um, what changes are being implemented? Uh, clearly there's a sort of a cultural challenge with feedback and being collaborative based on the report. So are, are you aware of any changes that are taking place? And this would be for, for any of you. 
Thank you, Senator. When the panel completed the report, uh, our mission was done. And so the panel has, uh, in effect, disbanded since, since the report was submitted. Uh, however, the follow-up responsibilities to the findings and recommendations have been provided to the FAA, and the administrator uh, has made uh, appropriate replies to that uh, from what we could tell. Um, we, we believe that all of our um, uh, recommendations should be implemented. I don't believe that any have been yet. I mean, it's only been a few weeks. Uh, but our, rec our, our feeling is that while not a comprehensive set of remedies for all that ails Boeing, it's at least a really good set of first steps if they were to implement what we have recommended. And if I may add, uh, in our last findings and as recommendation 51, 52, 53 to both Boeing and FAA is to work together in, in, and meet periodically to make sure that recommendations are being implemented. And as far as I remember, FAA Administrator, Mr. Whitaker, has given Boeing three months since February or early March to come up with a plan as how they are going to implement that. And our panel, and I think it's in our report, we volunteered to help Boeing during our interview event to, to resolve some of these issues. And there is a statement somewhere in our report that they didn't really take this opportunity to our, our, our kind offer to, to help. At least in my case, they didn't ask. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Schmidt. I, w I will note that we are going to hear from the company, and we've long said we were going to go to the FAA and then the company, because our oversight job is with the FAA and making sure they're implementing. Um, but I did mention at the beginning of this that they did cooperate with the interviews that you did conduct. And so we will hear from them, and my sense is they've digested your report, and by the time they get here, they'll have a lot of commentary about this, and so we'll look forward to hearing it. Uh, Senator Welch. Uh, thank you very much. Thank the witnesses. You know, people are pretty terrified. I mean, it's unreal when you think about it. In October 2018, uh, the Indonesian flight, 189 people, Mr. De Leon, Dr. De Leon, uh, died. March 2019, Ethiopia Airlines. And then, of course, on January 5th, the door blows off. Uh, I mean, bottom line, uh, people are wondering all the time whether they should fly on a Boeing plane. Uh, is the public safe right now? I'll start with you, Dr. Del or Dr. Dellinger, and we'll go down the line. That's the bottom line question a lot of folks have. Are we safe on a Boeing plane? As best I understand it at this point, I, uh, I have continued to fly on Boeing aircraft. And, uh, and I hope that they have taken our findings and recommendations to heart and implement them. Yeah. Hesitation makes me feel like you've taken your chances. Uh, Dr. DeLuis, uh, uh, De, De, De yes. I'm sorry. So that's fine. Uh, I, I get asked this question all the time. I get asked this question, is and it I safe? And I do too. Is it safe? And so here, here's what I answer, and I don't know if it's a... I say, you know, the safest place for a rocket is sitting on the pad. The safest place for an airplane is sitting in a hangar. The safest place for you and me is on our couch doom scrolling through Instagram. And yet every day, rockets launch, airplanes fly, and we get up and we go and do something productive. Safety is always a trade. Having said that, the, uh, within the airplane world, you have to look at what's happening and go, how comfortable am I? flying in this airplane versus that airplane. For me personally, yeah. I keep track of what's happening on the MAX for obvious reasons, right. and, and I'm worried about what's happening on the MAX. Well, thank you. Now, if I had to fly somewhere uh, because there was, and there was no other option, I would absolutely fly it versus driving, for example, because I can make that trade. But, you know, I think, they, I think the public's entitled to more confidence in the security and safety of flying. Dr. Mishkati, there's, you know, there seems to be like to be two issues about safety. Uh, one are the practices and the culture of the manufacturer. 
Uh, and the other is how much they uh, put profit ahead of safety, because it is a trade-off. The more they're going to focus on safety, that's going to come at some expense. Uh, and I understand there's problems in both uh, 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 those elements for Boeing. It, would you say that's true? It was uh, very much discussed, Senator, I think, in this uh, seminal book by Peter Robinson, Flying Blind, and the issue of the putting, uh, and basically that this, this is a delicate balance, Senator, between safety and, and profitability. And we know that these companies, they are not in philanthropic business. They need to make money. But it's really the job. This is one of the tenets of safety culture, to give proportional attention to safety goals versus production goals. And in the case of Boeing, unfortunately, based on the way that is chronicled very nicely in this book, that has happened after the merger with McDonnell Douglas. So can you attribute, you attribute some of that change to after the merger? Yes. And based tell me on, what the dynamic was. The dynamic was, because if you look at the history of McDonnell Douglas, in fact, I was reading another book by, by John Nance uh, about, it's called Blind Trust, about the series of problems that McDonnell Douglas had, crashes and that. And the, the mentality over there was just to push, push and make more aircraft, not really pay attention to detail, and then somehow resolve that later. And that, unfortunately, according to my reading of the book by Peter Robinson and some of the series of great articles by, by uh, Mr. Dominic Gates in Seattle Times, it also chronicles this issue. And we have seen that, unfortunately. Okay, let me ask you one last question. What would you have to see from Boeing to, for you to have confidence that they had successfully developed human factors as a technical discipline in design practice? In, I personally, and I may distance myself from my distinguished colleague a little bit, I use my USC professorial academic freedom. I like to see the human factors person, the top person, have equal power and authority as the chief engineer. This is what I like to see. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, following up on that, uh, we may have a couple more members coming, uh, but if not, uh, we'll... Uh, conclude the hearing soon. But Dr. Mishkati, the report states that during the development of the 5-7 and 6-7, human factors in the flight deck operations were the gold standard in part because human factor specialists wor worked closely and collectively in Seattle. Uh, then the report goes on to say, quote, the role of human factors is and its influence eroded to a series of administration issues, including reorganization, decentralization, downsizing, and relocation of the company's headquarters. What does that have to do with human factors? Human factors works very good when they are very close to engineers and system designers. They exchange information, they work together, they work on the design of the system, and then they work on the training and that, and they, they solve that problem together. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the business of promoting book, but chapter nine of this book, which is about human factors, which, uh, I strongly recommend that. That shows the way that the, the demise of the human factors or erosion of the human factors. One of them, for example, is chronicled in the book, is when, and when the simulator trainings and that was totally moved away from the design and that from Seattle to Florida or somewhere else. That, the, that is when you see a problem. I think that was just the training, though, right? The but training, but before that, also the, the, during the design, because you get some of that input from the training coming oh, back to the design. You, you think that doesn't exist in a in a holistic way? You're Absolutely. saying okay, a and holistic the, and, and centralized feedback. way. Holistic and centralized way. Holistic and central. Okay. Thank you, Senator. Um. I wanted to ask about this in, in regards to the FAA. So most of the report is focused on what you can do to make sure that you have a strong safety culture within the organization and how much that has to be backed up by the FAA. What does the FAA need to do to have its own safety system improvements to make sure that it is thinking about human factors? Uh, 
or across the board, a variety of issues that can enhance security, particularly at a time of changing technology. How do we get an FAA who is, is up to speed? ANCSA said, let's have this group that is at the beginning of the certification process kind of detail out more of the risk factors so that that discussion could happen. So um, that's actually very, uh, you know, we focused a lot about, uh, especially since January 5th, on the need to put more FAA boots on the grounds in the factory. And, and I might, am by no means saying that's a bad idea. That's an excellent idea. But uh, what you point out about the technology is why I think that uh, ODA or DER or delegation of some sort is here with us forever because the FAA does not have the resources to be able to, 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 to be the world's experts on these technologies. That's not what they're there for. The world's experts reside at Boeing or whatever. The key thing, I think, is that the FAA has to have the ability to interface with the world's experts. And that's a different set of skills that, 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 that's needed. You're not gonna be conducting the cutting edge research, but you should be able to talk to the people that are developing that technology and be able to understand it, and in particular, understand how it impacts the safety and the, the operation of the aircraft. Um, I keep going back to, to, to a, something that, that was said earlier about the need for the FAA to really step up its own SMS. I, I think that that's, that's critical. If you have that, then you have a chance of being able to proper, appropriately interface with the people you're supposed to regulate. If you don't have that, you're sort of uh, you know, spectators at the, at the party here. And um, I think that, that they, should be, they should be encouraged or directed or whatever it is, however it is that you do it, to, uh, to move in that direction. Thank you. Uh, Senator Blackburn, are you ready? Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I want to thank all of you for being with us today. I think this aviation safety issue is something that we are all concerned about and are um, it, we're going to stay in behind this. I appreciate the chairman's attention to this um, to this issue. Dr. Miscotti, I want to come to you, and I think I'm saying your name right. Correct me if I'm not. Um, I was reading a report about the aerospace maintenance competition where the 450 airplane mechanics met to show off their skills and they were working in 15 minute time slots, troubleshooting issues. And I think in 15 minutes, it's pretty remarkable what people are able to do. And it's important to know that there are skilled people. You look at what has happened with these different reports, Alaska Airlines, United Airlines, the Boeing planes that have come up so when you look at this and you see the skills training that some of them have where is the disconnect in this where is is it a lack of skill is it um a, a lack of training or preparation or you know is it inattention uh why are we beginning to have such a negative impact see such a neg negative impact on on safety. Thank you, Senator. This issue, we didn't uh, study that here, but your question reminds me of uh, Aloha Airline and the, the accident that it had around, I think it was 1988 or so. And it was started with the aviation maintenance related problem. And at that time, uh, the FAA, really looked uh, a very hard look at the aviation maintenance and they, I think they created a program called National Plan for Aviation Maintenance. And then at that time, one board member of NTSB who was later uh, elected to NTSB, uh, the Honorable John Golia, pushed on this a lot. The issue of aviation maintenance, ma'am, is extremely sensitive to the human factors and safety culture issues that uh, my colleague, Dr. Dillinger, is talking about here. Yeah. And okay, th let me do this. Uh, Dr. Dillinger, let me come to you because I know you conducted hours of interviews for 
the safety report that you produced. Did you speak with any of the whistleblowers when you conducted those interviews? As far as I recollect, we did not speak to did a whistleblower. Not. Why did you not talk to any of the whistleblowers? That, that was not what the purview of the, uh, of the panel. And at the time, uh, I don't think we weren't aware of the whistleblowers. Or, okay. Or that. Let me ask you this then. Does Boeing do enough to ensure that their employees know that there will be no retaliation if they come forward and report safety issues? The panel believes they need to do a lot more than what they are currently doing. And, you know, one of the things that we have heard from, um, from NTSB is that there is a problem getting information from Boeing. Um, do you think that Boeing executives do not understand when there is an investigation, they need to come forward with complete information? Um, I mean, I can't speak for the executives. I, I will say that uh, Boeing is a very large and very bureaucratic company uh, that produces a lot of paper. Uh, and um, I'm not surprised that there are lags in their responses because that's, they're, they're just, that's just the way it is. But I can't speak for them. I, I will tell you, reading the report and Boeing's uh, safety culture being described as inadequate and confusing, uh, this is something that harms the flying public, and I appreciate the attention to the issue. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blackburn. Uh, Senator Warnock. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, listen, the stakes are simply too high for commercial aircraft to have the kinds of systemic problems that we're seeing with Boeing. So I'd like to examine how we got here with this panel. Dr. DeLuise, uh, yes or no, through organization designation authorizations or ODAs, can the FAA, can the FAA delegate certain safety certification and other responsibilities to an aircraft manufacturer like Boeing? Yes or no? Um, yes, sir. yes, but yes. <laughs> uh, currently, yes, because it's done with other manufacturers, but there are issues, as described in our report, that makes us be leery of saying, yeah, go ahead and just do it. I think that the Boeing needs to prove that it is capable of doing it. But the question is, it, 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 are they able to delegate certain safety and certification uh, responsibilities to an air, air, aircraft like so? So they are. The answer is yes, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Dr. Dillinger, yes or no? Can uh, a an aircraft manufacturer like Boeing subcontract manufacturing responsibilities for, say, the fuselage of its signature mass Max aircraft line to the, another company? The work of the panel, I think, would say yes. Like with ODAs, that we heard successful examples of ODA delegation. However, the concerns remain about the risk that Boeing's safety culture presents to that process. Yeah, I, 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 I share that concern, which is why I'm asking the question. Dr. Meshkadi, yes or no, can a manufacturer subcontracted by Boeing such as Spirit Aerosystems assign manufacturer responsibilities to an international affiliate in Malaysia, for example. 787 is now made all over the world. Wings in one country, uh, the other wing in another country, fuselage in another country, they are doing that. So, so the authorization uh, can then be passed uh, uh, from FAA to a manufacturer. The manufacturer can subcontract that manufacturing responsibility um, uh, uh, to another entity. And then the manufacturer subcontracted by Boeing can assign manufacturing responsibilities to an international affiliate. 
which, which uh, I'm sure you've realized that what we've walked through step by step is a supply chain of the Boeing Max 9 aircraft at the heart of the near catastrophic door plug blowout that happened on January, uh, in January 2024 uh, to an Alaska Airlines flight. Um, you know, there are many words for this. You can call it delegating, subcontracting, reassigning. At the end of the day, it's outsourcing. Outsourcing key responsibilities, none more important than safety oversight, to someone else, to someone else, to someone else. Uh, I submit that while we're focused on Boeing, this is obviously not just a Boeing problem. This is far too, uh, this is far too common across aviation systems and its suppliers, whether the result of poor leadership, a focus on production targets, profit margins, at all costs, even the cost of safety, or some combination of both, uh, Congress must take a serious look at this culture of outsourcing and its safety implications. Um, th th this is an instance in which we, we can't afford a mistake. It costs too much. Um, Dr. Dillinger, what more can Boeing do to improve its safety culture and our own, res and our own responsibility for the safety of its products? Thank you, Senator. The panel focused a great deal on safety culture, and there is so much that they could be doing. Part of it has to do with the timing, and if they were to accelerate the efforts, I think, we, and the panel thinks that that would be beneficial. There has been uh, a very uh, soft start to that, to implementing the training, to uh, getting feedback back from employees via their own surveys, to uh, providing workshops, to focusing specifically on training at different levels. So for example, executive training, yes, but down through the other layers of the organization to managers and supervisors, targeted training. Uh, those are, there's a multiple ways that they could be going after that. And as they look at a more comprehensive way where they really dive in, and in a more timely way address that. The panel felt that that would be important and that it was in our recommendations. Great, that. Thank, thank you so very much for that. Dr. D. Luis and Dr. Meshkati, last question. What more can Congress do to encourage both the FAA and manufacturers like Boeing to take direct responsibility for the safety of aircraft and our aviation system? Uh, I believe that um, the uh, Congress and this committee needs to keep the essentially the pressure on to make sure that uh, the, F, the waivers are not granted for, on safety related issues, for example, that would be a, a good thing because they, 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 right now there are a handful of waivers on the max that directly affect safety. Uh, but you need to keep the spotlight on this because uh, it, in, during our interviews, we heard often the sentiment expressed, yeah, this is happening now, but as soon as everybody moves on to something else, we're going to go back to the way things were. And that can't happen. It's too, as you say, it's too expensive, and the cost in human lives is just way too high. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. That is also related to an earlier question by Senator Cantwell. I think what Congress can do vis-a-vis -vis FAA and that's also related to the SMS. There is a document which is signed by FAA administrator and then chair of NTSB, the Honorable Robert Sonwald, is called State Safety Program. This is something that United States files with the International Civil Aviation Organization. Uh, in this one, this is very interesting, Senator. It talks about the safety management responsibility for the state for the application of SMS at FAA. What I would suggest and what can Congress do is to create another panel like the one that we are in, section 103, to look at the implementation of this report and how does United States stand vis-a-vis -vis this report. If this state safety program being fully implemented, what needs to be done? Because that has a kind of a impact or, or 
It can tremendously impact FAA's power on using uh, basically, in the case of SMS, for example, in United States, is only FAA, correct me, my colleagues here, has the SMS on for air traffic controller. Great. And SMS needs, they, there is a notice of rulemaking for SMS, but SMS needs to be fully incorporated. And if this document be fully implemented at FAA and other places, I think that would be a good solution. Thank you so much. Uh, I know I'm way out of time. I, think, I appreciate your indulgence, Madam Chair, and I look forward to working with my colleagues on this committee to improve uh, aviation safety. Thank you so much. Um, and just to clarify again one more time on this issue, because it's related to what he said and, and Senator Schmidt, and I want to emphasize, you know, people, we all represent big aviation states. We want this to be right, and we definitely believe in the workforce that we have in our states. We want them, you know, to continue to grow in expertise and excellence. So recommendation 30 and 31 of your report says foster an effective safety culture and publish a roadmap for workforce development with engineers and inspectors and oversee SMS for design and manufacturing organizations and partner with industry to measure the success of SMS and design an organization jointly review these measures of success on a regular basis. Okay, those are your two key recommendations about SMS. So the FAA is now in this rulemaking that is going to come out in the next 90 days. And so what specifically do you want to see in that rulemaking that will help guarantee this success? And then secondly, what do we do about this problem that Dr. DeLuise uh, suggests, which, it, listen, it's a whole of uh, government issue, if you ask me, because um, we could ask Dr. Dillinger about space in general, but it's we're trying to keep the government at pace with technological change. So you're saying the FAA may not have some of these people, and so how do we, wh what do we need to do? Because obviously we do want to listen to what these sectors say, and, and they have input. They, they really have some of the smartest people about this technology, but we also have to get our oversight correctly. So how do we make sure the FAA rulemaking has what we want to see in it? And how do we deal with this um, lack of uh, engineering, if you will, skill set at the FAA, not at the company? At the company, I think it exists. I think we're just not listening closely enough. I, I think, if I, if I may, I think that with regards to your first question, fortunately, SMS isn't new, right? It's been around in the aviation world now for 30 years. But it was voluntarily implemented right. as part of a 2015 consent decree instead of being a real mandatory no. SMS. So I'm hoping the FAA gets this right this time. But yes. No, what, what I meant is, is that it's been in the aviation industry for 30 years, not at Boeing. You're absolutely correct. So f fortunately, I, I mean, in a sense, all the FAA has to do is, is look at what it's done successfully with organizations like the airlines and, and others and apply those same standards and the same rules to, to Boeing. So they're, they're, they don't, it's not a blank sheet of paper is what I'm saying. They got something to draw on. With regards to your other question, I've always been a strong advocate of, of government agencies like the FAA drawing on the resources of the national academies. I mean, I see when, when new technology enters a field, such let's say, for example, AI, for example, because that's the one that's, that's the new technology du jour right now. You know, I've always been an advocate that, you know, you have these, these national academies right down the street here with members that you can draw upon to basically go in and advise and give people that know, know a lot more about these subjects than any of us. And I, I don't, some, some, some organizations do it more than others, but I think that, the, that, that that's a resource that FAA and NASA and other agencies don't, don't use enough, in my, in my opinion. The National Academy, I have just one good news, uh, uh, Dr. Deleuze. FAA has gone to National Academy, and National Academy has created a panel of, they call it, community of experts for risk analysis of transport aircraft. And that one, I have the privilege of being a member. We meet over Zoom weekly, and I think it has been great, because FAA has reached out to nuclear power industry for that community of experts how do they do PRA, probabilistic assessment? They do that here. Back to you, Senator Cantwell. I think that two recommendations that you 
brought up 31 and 30 is fantastic. That's exactly that I think in light of this state safety program, if these two be combined together, I think that's going to be a paradigm shift for SMS. Well, I, I think it's pretty simple to get a real SMS, and I think it's a, a great idea, as we envisioned in ANCSA, to get a panel of experts. So I'm glad to see that that is actually happening with the national academies as it relates to this uh, input. Um, I, I don't. We'll have to query the FAA more on exactly how broad that can go. Dr. Dillinger, I'm going to leave the last question to you because, um, you know, as, uh, as, as painful as all this is, to me, we can get through it. And, and um, I think you're referencing your work on the Columbia. That was also a very painful moment for NASA, a very painful moment for this committee. I sat on the oversight investigation of that that the committee did in joint uh, session with um, other uh, Senate committees. So, but but we did get through that. What do you think are the lessons learned here? How can you? How can we successfully move past this and on to uh, the success that we want to see in aviation? Because I think the foundation is very strong. We have a great hundred years of aviation success. We want to build on it. As Dr. Louise said, we want to be known for the successes that the United States has had in aviation. And I, I think the elements are there. What, what, what is it that we need to do to learn from what Columbia learned on how to move forward? Thank you, Senator. That has been my life for decades. Um, I think what we learned from Columbia that's applicable here and was applicable to the report is how important people are and the relationships between people. That's what the safety culture issues all address. It's about trust, it's about communication, it's about being there. And having a workforce that comes in that is prepared, that's trained, that's energetic, that's curious, that's dedicated, that will work their heart out. An organization can recover from a catastrophic loss when that's happened by pulling all of those resources together and focusing on then the mission and how everybody works towards the mission to make that happen. But to do that, all of those parts, including the processes, have to come together with safety as a priority where people understand that it's just part of doing business. It's it, Brian O'Connor, the former chief of safety for NASA, used to talk about it's, safety isn't the mission, it's how we do the mission. And that's a critical lesson learned for, for us. Thank you. Well, I want to thank the witnesses again today. You'll, um, the record will remain open until May 15th. Any senators wishing to submit questions for the record should do so by May 1st. And we ask responses be returned by May 15th. That concludes our hearing today. And again, thank you for your report and your willingness to be here today. We're adjourned.